Hello guys. So, <clears throat> it's been a long time since I've been able to make a proper video. I'm going to actually get this set up properly because I used to have plenty of stuff for doing uh, basic vlogging with and stuff like that. It's, I used to do it in the past. So, I've gone and scrounged some of my gear up and I'm going to get set up a bit better so that we can actually start doing some drives together. So obviously, you realise that this car is running on open pilot. You can see the phone up there that they call the Eon. Basically, it's a phone with a heatsink stuck on the back and a little board which powers a fan and goes from USB-C to some ancient mini USB that no one in the world uses except for them. And it talks to something called the Panda, which is uh, just a little embedded processor. Um, little arm processor, it's got a GPS chip on it and it basically just communicates with the CAN buses and the phone. And that's it. So all we do is we chop into the bus between the camera and the car and we listen to what the car says, listen to what the camera says and then give out our own steer signals and that's really as simple as that. The thing is that it's actually not that simple in practice but that's how it works. So today I'm going for a bit of a drive. I don't actually know how to get there. I know roughly how to get there. So I'm going to actually take this as an opportunity to not just show off what Open Pilot can do. So from here on, I'm not driving. The car's going to drive. Open Pilot's in control. If I ever touch the steering wheel, I will let you know, just so you get an idea as to how long we can go on roads such as this without any intervention. Now, corners like this, used to actually be an issue in the past. Um, not so much with uh, losing it on corners like that, but because it had grabbed the wrong set of lines. So the guys at Comma have done really good at training the model for areas like that, and it now drives rather well around them. So you'll see that I actually get some uh, rather long distances. Now I'm running the community build for this car, not Comma's build, and there are some major differences, so we'll go through those as we drive along. Now, since we're going to be doing a lot of this, I'm going to actually show roughly what this car's like to own. So I was looking at a lot of different cars when I bought this. I was looking at the Jap cars, like uh, the Kluger. I was looking at you know, European cars, like the Audis, the Audi Q7. And I was also looking at the Model X. Now, unfortunately, the Model X was an impractical car for me. Not only was it uh, excessively expensive, not saying that I couldn't have got it, but I would have regretted it in every way, because one, it would have been very hard to pay, I don't make that much money, and the other issue being that I commonly do eight or 900 kilometres in a day, and I don't stop anywhere near where a supercharger is, and that's, that hurts, and because I'm always towing, that eight or 900 kilometers isn't a one charge trip, that's a multiple charge trip, and that makes it even more painful. Especially since, you know, I'm looking at half hour detours to get to superchargers. And, yeah, then I've got a large trailer that I need to deal with, and it's just, it's unfortunately that wasn't a practical vehicle. So not only with the cost, but the practicality. So then, since this was a major factor, I wanted a car that could basically drive for me because I do do large kilometres and fatigue is a major concern. I wanted to reduce fatigue as much as possible, make the drive as safe as I can. So I looked at everything out there, the Toyotas, the Mazdas, I honestly did look at them all. And at this stage I didn't know that Open Pilot existed. I, just, I actually planned to do the whole thing from scratch myself. I spent ages searching around on the internet trying to find stuff and eventually Open Pilot popped up. I looked at all the supported cars and there was nothing there that was any good. Uh, the closest was the uh, Kluger. I took that for a test drive and the sales actually have a Kia next door so when I went to that one um, they pushed me over here to check out the Sorento. Now spec sheet alone was enough to sell me on this car. It's got better warranty, it's got better, well pretty much everything. It's a much better car at a lower price. And the engine on it is just incredible. I mean, it's not a powerful engine, but I mean, the economy of it, the like, especially for the size, the pollution, like, it's, for a fossil, it's a very good fossil. That's really what it comes down to. 
So, things like the Audi and that, I had many concerns in regards to pulling one of those apart. They've got the worst reputation for support in Australia. You can pretty much guarantee if you get an Audi, they're going to bend you over. So there's plenty of reasons to push me away from the European cars as well. Anyway, at the end of the day, I really wanted an EV. That's the truth. I just, it wasn't practical at this stage. And I didn't want to spend a huge amount of money on a fossil when, as far as I'm concerned, fossils should be exactly where the rest of the fossils are. It's in the ground and dead and gone. Thing of the past. So I ended up picking on this. And obviously picked the top trim. So I went in there and basically looked at the best and said, that's, that's what we're going with. Uh, I basically walked in, had a chat to him and bought it on the day. There was no mucking around. And this is what I've got. So for six weeks, I actually checked eight so that I was correct when I did this little blog. For six weeks, I spent my time figuring out, one, how Overpilot was coded. So what I did, actually did was I ordered this and then I went home and jumped on the internet and ordered the Eon and Panda. Did all this on the same day. So, okay, driver monitoring, that's five minutes of no touch in the wheel. I'm not running on three minutes, so you can see I just got a little touch. Not on three minutes because uh, there's so-called driver monitoring in countries like Australia where we have a right-hand drive vehicle. It's actually passenger monitoring. I don't have a passenger and it's pretty much going to uh, try to monitor the side of my face since the passenger's not there and do a horrendous job. If I got a passenger, it does a really good job of saying the passenger's distracted since they're usually playing on the phone, looking out the window, doing other things, not particularly watching the road, and it'll constantly say I'm distracted. So passenger monitoring, rubbish. So I have to deal with the timer, and five minutes is about right. Uh, if it didn't drive this well, obviously I wouldn't be on five minutes, but I've slowly lengthened it. I went to ten minutes at one point, I thought, nah, I really do need a bit shorter, like let's say I fell asleep or something like that. Five minutes is about the maximum I think it should go without having to be in the vent. So a little bit more than what their policy says, but it's okay. Now this particular area, I'm not going to use the blinkers just to show how it merges. The lane gets too short, small, jumps over to the next lane, and we, we're going to keep driving. So anyway, back to the story. In the six weeks, I... I didn't actually even touch Open Pilot until the hardware arrived. So I'd already had the car and already done a couple thousand Ks on it at this point. It took forever to get from America to here. So we, I stuck it in the car, cut the loom because there was no plugs. I searched everywhere for plugs. I talked to them. They tried to get them from Ket, um, the Kia, blah, 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 whatever they are, the company that make the connectors. And uh, basically... I failed at every single point of those, so I just got side cutters out, soldering iron, and soldered it in, and job's done. So we were about 2,000 k's at this point, about a week in. And then I started, you know, looking at the CAN bus, and luckily there was a leaked DBC for some other Hyundai, which pretty much matched up perfectly, so I pretty much had every signal I needed straight away. So what I had to do was port a make that's had, you know, nothing done for it, well there was a little bit done by a couple like Chris Hours, he'd started doing it but basically he didn't even have the car state done yet, it didn't work. So I pretty much had to start from scratch, I ended up restarting the whole thing after mucking around with his port for a bit because it, it was easier just to start from scratch. So anyway, what I ended up doing was going through step by step, I got car state going, learning what car state was. And I ended up putting debug code everywhere in all of the stuff you're not meant to touch just to figure out how things were working as I was going through. Got car state going and had this beautiful thing pop up on the screen saying that I got disabled steering that. Pop up saying that, you know, driver monitoring, exit, like, you know, keep your hands on the wheel, do something, controls destarted. I was happy. And that was at, you know, probably the week four mark. So getting time for the next two weeks, I'm going to touch the steering wheel only to slow down. So we've got to slow down to 80 here. So you can see I've got 82 on the screen. And we're actually going to do 79 because that's how far out the car's dash is or the cluster is compared to what the car actually does. So then I started working on the control side of things and I didn't care about the stock camera. I just redid everything all the messages. I'm going to grab the steering wheel here so it doesn't wander over to the left. I'll leave it go this time so you can see how it's wandered over. 
that's why I grabbed the steering wheel. Anyway, so what I did is I completely mimicked the camera, giving static messages for everything except for steer, lanes, and that it's active. And that was about it. So, I got that working on week six, I got it steering, and there's a YouTube video showing a handheld camera of me with this thing steering horrendously on day one, and that was week six of owning the vehicle, and a week four to five of having been working on autopilot. And immediately after that I worked on tuning, getting tuning better, and then finding the little bugs that I had here or there where messages weren't quite what I thought they were, and uh, basically by the end of week one of running open pilot which unfortunately I never gave a video of I just I've really been busy guys week one of running open pilot um, I pretty much had it right and I started passing camera messages through so the stock camera stayed in place that way we had things like high beam assist which doesn't work um, we, we gain other things like um, accident avoidance which doesn't work emergency oh sorry actually that one does the collision warning does work it beeps whenever you go to overtake people because you accelerate behind them and it goes oh you're gonna crash or well, you're not gonna crash you can't do it on purpose so it's just it's a bit panicky and as for it applying the brakes no no you don't it, it doesn't work like it might work but you're an idiot if you ever trust it and if you needed it then you weren't watching the road and you probably deserve to crash and get penalized Anyway, it, I passed all those th things through anyway because at least insurance-wise I've got everything there that's needed. And I really didn't do much after that. I added little tiny features here and there just to make it a little bit more usable. And then after a couple months of driving, Common decided to go and uh, refactor my port and uh, they bought a Santa Fe, which is basically this car. And it actually turns out the 2019 Santa Fe in America that they bought is this car in Australia with next to no changes at all. They've got little tiny bits here and there. They've got a new camera, which has got new messages and everything like that. But, yeah, for the most part, it is the identical vehicle. Now, when I... Just interrupting here. When I turn on the blinker, it disables steering. Blinker stops, and then one second later, the steering takes over. This is not a common thing, this is again something else I've added in the community port to try and make it a nicer system to use because fighting the system, steering you as you're changing lanes is not a good feature, it's, it's a bad feature. We'll go through over more things that I change as they come along. So anyway, they refactored my port and they did a reasonably good job at it, but when I say reasonably good job um, because I actually did the entire port learning it as I was going along they did a very good job at it but they have they took out heaps of my features in the process and I've been slowly putting them back in and they're not all back in yet because I haven't had the time but most of most of the important ones are back in and that's they're not all going to be upstreamed so that's why the community port exists some of them that have been upstreamed already which is nice uh, and yeah, basically the after that, that's all I've been doing is adding features. I really haven't had to touch tuning at all. Uh, the tuning between the Santa Fe and this vehicle is enormous difference, no, absolutely enormous. It's nearly twice the torque at the same value that I have compared to the Santa Fe has. Now whether that's actually a limitation of the Santa Fe simply not having the same torque or whether it's just that the MDPS has got different tuning, I don't know. But the point is that they aren't the same. And only time will tell, but at this stage I've got more torque than I need and Santa Fe, those guys believe they've got more torque than they need, so everyone's happy regardless. So this trip, now that I've given a really long story as to how I got this far and where we are at the moment, I've got a fairly long drive today. Um, it's not a long, long drive, it'll take about an hour and 15 minutes and I'm not going to do much on this trip. I'm, I've got maybe at best half an hour's work and you know, that's how it generally works, three hours of driving for half an hour's work and then go back home and do an hour's paperwork. And then I gotta head off to another job straight away, so no time to muck around. And 
I'm going to decided to show you guys how this steers and also what this car's like to drive. So we'll start with first the comfort. So obviously the steering wheel is really nice because you don't ever touch it, it's not going to wear, it's going to do pretty good. But no, honestly, this isn't the nicest steering wheel. It's a it's very thin, not a bad thin, I don't mind it, but compared to most cars, it's it's a rather thin steering wheel. And then it's this noisy, this just the sound when you I was gonna think I've touched now, but anyway, because I did. The sound of the wheel when you're driving. It doesn't feel like it doesn't sound like a quality steering wheel. It sounds cheap, but other than that, it's actually really nice leather. It feels nice. Um, it's got it's a heated steering wheel, which is nice. Yeah, it just doesn't it doesn't sound right when you're dri turning a corner and then you're letting it straight. Nothing goes. <laughs> yeah, that's really the only complaint I've got about that. Um, other than that, the cabin noise of this vehicle at yeah, lower speeds it's a fossil and it sounds like a loud fossil like the diesel engine just rattles you accelerate and you hear this horrible rattly rattle and it's the engine's actually quite loud um, compared to things like the Touareg and um, Audis and things like that their engines like even their diesels are quite quiet like they're quite nice to drive they're almost like a petrol they're not a petrol like they're still rattly old mongrels but they're a lot better than what this one is. Having said that, if you spe check the specs, this thing is way better in regards to power to engine size, power to fuel used, just everything. These are actually really, really good engine. So, ignoring the noise, they're a good engine. But they are loud. Uh, once you get above about 60 k's an hour... We've got an overtake lane ahead. Um, once you get above about 60 k's an hour, all you've got is road noise. You can't hear the engine anymore, the engine becomes insignificant. Got a sound meter with me. I'll slow that down so that you can get a better readings. So that's about it. It's it's a pretty quiet Turn vehicle. Merge right ahead. At 100 k's, anything below 70 decibels is pretty good. Uh, and I don't know why to, that. It's only a cheap sound meter. It's about 68 decibels in here on this road. On some roads, it gets a lot more. But on this particular road, it's 68 decibels, and that's a genuine 68 decibels. That's really what it is. Um, yeah, it's just the sound meter being crap when you see those fights. That's what happens when you buy a uni T. Oh, uh, uh. Ah, sorry about that. Okay, so comfort wise in the seats, it's quite nice. Uh, to be honest, it's actually not quite nice. It's extremely nice. The seats are very comfortable. Um, it's got memory seats, two seat positions. I'll I really should actually drag a camera around and show the car off. But anyway, two seat positions, two memory seat positions, which is perfect for me and my wife because she's really short and I'm not. Uh, yeah, what more can you say? For the most part of driving, that's all you really care about because everything else is just gimmicks. Cruise control works. The adaptive cruise control works extremely well, uh, which we'll see soon enough since we've got a caravan in front of us, but none of them ever travelled a decent speed. <coughs> the built-in lane keep assist actually works rather well. It nags you every bloody 10 seconds or so. It's oh. ah. Yeah, the thing is that it could actually go five minutes or so without needing to be touched. It's it is rather good on road like this. You almost can trust it. It is drunk. It does wander. It drifts left and then right, and it hugs the lanes as it does both. But the point is that it does actually do rather good. That they've got no confidence in it. And it's a, that drunk. And the other one is the moment that it can't see a lane, it doesn't go ding or anything to let you know that it's wrong. It's just like, oh, oh there's no lane. Well, I'm not going to help anymore. And it just disables itself, just stops steering altogether. 
Like, how dangerous can you make a system? How dangerous can you make a factory stock system? Well, that's pretty dangerous. You can do that. So here's the stock SCC, smart cruise controls, they call it. Adaptive cruise controls, what everyone else calls it. Um, it sees this slow, horrendous excuse for a holiday unit in front of us. And it's let us down 93. Bringing us to a dead stop, these actually drive really well as well. They're much better than the Bosch units if you've ever experienced one of those, like what the Hondas and that have. It's better than the uh, Fords as well, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. I suppose this thing, the media control unit. So you can see that it's... I've got Bluetooth audio. Yeah, I, I'm not listening to anything because I'm talking to you guys. But anyway, this is the built-in maps. The maps are pretty good, and the system works pretty bad. And if you want to navigate somewhere, it's absolutely horrible. So let's do exactly that. We'll hit the nav button, and we're going to go to here. Yeah, you see that? That's like you know, 10 years ago, what Navman had, and it really is that bad. I want to go to Rainbow. I should actually be able to use this Rainbow now. That is the dumbest spot ever for a hazard button. I hit it then, I always hit it. Like if you want to use the media control, you rest your hand there so you don't bump, but you rest your hand on the button, on the button. The button is right where you rest your hand. Dumbest spot ever. Anyway, like that is a serious flaw and that annoyed me from day one. So we're gonna to go to Rainbow and we're about 60 kilometers away from Rainbow. Now if I wanted to go you know, to an actual address, I pretty much have to click address and type the whole address in. And we're going to set as destination and it's going to calculate our ad and start talking to me. I'm going to turn off soon, I'm actually lucky I did this, otherwise I'd have gone the wrong way. The route guidance will start now. Continue on Western Highway for about one kilometre. So we're at Dimbula. So yeah, it actually navigates really well. When it shows corners coming up, um, it shows them on the, uh, what do you call it, dash in front of me as well. It's all rather nice. Like, it does actually work rather well. So, we're 800 metres from the corner, 790. It'll ding again soon. It'll show it. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Um, the sun's probably in the wrong position. But it'll pop up there as well to say that I've got to go and do something. This is my corner here. Meters, turn right onto Nimbula Rainbow Road. Oh, maybe it won't. Maybe I've got to actually go to that. There it is. There. And I'd better wait for those cars and trucks. These things out auto hold as well. So I don't need to hold my foot on the brake, auto hold goes green, take the foot off the brake and it sits in until I touch the accelerator. It's it's very Continue standard, or at least I thought it was in newer vehicles until I started test driving a lot of them and finding out that it's actually not that common. It should be. Now, honestly, today, it should be. And on the Kia Sorento it is. Railway crossing ahead. But regardless how good you think that nav system is, um, it's really not that good. It, it hasn't yet given me foot. One of the worst nav systems I've used was actually one of the best. Uh, if anyone ever had a Windows phone, they were... Oh, it's only 80 k's here. I don't think that's correct. It is 100. Um, now, here's actually a really good road. The stock lane keep assist has no chance of doing anything on this road. We're doing pretty good. And this is what the last half of my trip is going to be on as a road like this. So I really wanted a system that was going to work on a road like this. So I'm not touching the steering wheel. I'm going to try and pull it this way and hope that it grabs the right lanes, lines, sorry, which it has, let go, and it wanders off again. But anyway, at least I don't have to steer. It's doing okay. It's just narrow lanes. It really doesn't like narrow lanes. <coughs> anyway, the Windows phone. They, their navigation had the best screen, it searched beautifully, it had bugger all results when you searched, like compared to what Google did. Um, like it, way worse than even Apple Maps, like it was really bad at finding things, but when you navigated it was 
the best. It was better than the Navmans and the Garmin's, um, better than, like, honestly, better than Google Maps and Apple Maps. It was excellent. But twice on one single trip that I had going along roads like this, like they weren't unsealed road, roads or anything, they were still, you know, decent roads. And it tells me to turn left. No, right, turn left. 400 meters, turn left. Right, turn left. 400 meters, turn left. What is going on? Turn left, and then zoom out of the map, and it's just got me doing a little square, and then driving on down the road. Well, that's weird. Turn left, and then as I get up to the point that I'd maybe turned before, it goes, turn left. It was putting me in a little infinite loop of just driving around around this block. It was never gonna actually let me continue down the road. Twice on the trip it did that. And the other time it was about a four or five kilometer detour, so I didn't spot it straight away. I'm driving that down this road for four or five kilometers and goes, do a U-turn when safe. I'm like, you gotta be shitting me. And I zoom out and it's just a back and forward line. It's just another little infinite loop that it was gonna take me on. I was like, nah. <laughs> Not using that anymore. Threw the Windows phone away. Well, actually, I didn't. I threw it in the set of console and pulled out the Android. I had many issues with Apple Maps as well. There was a perfect example um, when I got the iPhone X was, and it's not iPhone 10, it's an X. We don't use Roman numerals anymore. Grow up. So when I got the iPhone X, uh, what we did was um, went to a place maybe three kilometers north from here. So we're talking, you know, rather the center of nowhere. But either way, I said I wanted to go to this particular motel. And I had all three phones with me. I had the uh, 970, 950, yeah, 950X. I don't know, I've got videos on my other channel about it. Anyway, I got a 950XL, let's say it was that one. It was, you know, Microsoft's best phone. I had Apple Maps and on the iPhone X, and I had uh, my Pixel 2 on Google Maps. And this was just for shits and giggles. I had all three navigating me. All three wanted to take me to different places but they all thought they knew where it was. Now, one of them was about 20 minutes away in a totally different town, just up the road, uh, like literally just up the road, for, but either way, 20 minutes away, that was Apple. And then the other two were on opposite sides of the town. Now, because Apple was the first one, first destination, because of the direction we were coming, we decided to go and drop in where Apple wanted it, and it was just a house, and that's all it was, just a house. There's no motel, nothing. It was 100% wrong. So, welcome to Apple Maps. And um, we're not talking long ago, we're talking, you know, maybe three or four months ago that this happened. So, Apple Maps are still rubbish. So, the next one was, we knew that Google would be right, because Google's always right. And the truth is, it is. When it comes to Australia, it's Google or nothing. Like, even in Horsham, which is a rather big town, um, one of the main roads, it doesn't even get addresses correct, Apple Maps. It's, it is hideous. I, I honestly don't know. I don't have the Microsoft phone anymore. Um, I finally got rid of that. I, it was, it's actually a pity Microsoft never succeeded because it would have been nice to have that third player in the game. But anyway, I don't have that phone anymore. Now, this is really good. This is an 85k corner. 85k corner. I'm not driving. The car's driving. So this is a rather sharp corner. And you'll see how good Kia is. So this is where it ran out of torque and I've got to grab it. Now, again, last part of the corner, and again, it didn't quite have enough torque. The way that I've basically worked on how much torque I have is if you can do it without it suggesting you to slow down, it will do it. So if you get arrows up there saying this is a sharp corner, it'll drive around it. If it says 95 and you're doing 99, it'll drive around it. But if it says, you know, oh, that's just narrow lanes, so I had to grab that. If it says, you know, 85 and you're doing 100, it probably won't. It's going to run out of torque. Even if it did detect the lines, it's just going to run out of torque. And let's be honest, you really shouldn't be, you know, driving excessively fast around those corners anyway. Like, the truth is, cars can handle it fine, but they handle it fine in good conditions. If you got a trailer on behind and it's raining, you mightn't. So they're there for a reason. It's also the point where being a passenger is no longer comfortable because you follow the speed, you can sit comfortably in a car. When you drive uh, faster than you should, it's no longer where you're comfortable in the car. It, you, your bum kind of slides or you've got to hold on. 
it's no longer a nice ride for a passenger. Anyway, back to these maps. Geez, I get sidetracked a lot. Back to these maps. Uh, yeah, the next stop was uh, the Windows one, and believe it or not, it actually got us to a destination that would have been okay. It, I can't remember exactly, but basically, it was on the wrong road, but it was the motel. So as the motel took up, you know, it went through the entire block. I had to grab the steering wheel again there because, you know, narrow roads. And unfortunately, that's just a common thing with these roads. So it got us to the motel, but it got us to the back entry, which you can't get in. And then Google was on the other side of, you know, the road where you actually meant to get in. So it technically, Microsoft worked with their maps or... I can't remember who does their maps. Anyway, it worked here. But who is here? Anyway, here maps is what they had. Um, and yeah, the Google just worked. And that's generally the consensus. And this thing's the same. Like, you put in an address and you go, I want to go... And we actually tested a fair bit. We went down to Warnerborn. We went, I want to go and find Brecky. We just went cafe, go. And we... Yeah, oh, yeah, that sounds a nice little cafe down by the pier. We went there and there's no cafe. There's, it's just a residential street. And like, ah, let's go to the next cafe. Drive there and there's nothing again. And we're like, oh, bugger that. Plug the phone in. Use Android Auto. It works. Um, I've still got the iPhone X. This, thing's, this is one of the worst roads I've made, actually. There is it. Ah, it's in here. There it is. I haven't turned this thing on in so long. It's probably dead flat. Yeah. Will it turn on? Nope, nope, oh really? <laughs> ah, let's plug it in and charge it so we can't turn it on. And then once it turns on, we can have a look at what Android, oh uh, sorry, Apple, Apple Car, oh, it's dead. Anyway, it'll come back. Um, what Apple CarPlay actually looks like on this car. So we've looked at maps, we're in the middle of Antwerp, almost at Antwerp. Andrew, I will be in Horsham at about 9.30am. Will you be around to check your job? I'd better call this guy. Jeez. Uh, yeah, let me get back to this guy before I plug this in. And So I'm going to slow down back to 83. Because 83 is really, like this, 83. You watch what speed we actually go to. This is just manufacturers being... Back till the afternoon. I'm going to steer these corners. Like, I'll, actually, I won't steer this corner so you can see. Oh, look at that! Massive torque. Now, this is actually a really interesting thing that I've mentioned in the Hyundai channel. Once you drop just below 100 k's, you get more torque, and you get significantly more torque. Um, and <coughs> at lower speeds again you get significantly more torque again there seems to be several thresholds in there on how much torque you can actually put out so if I want a windy road and I set my you know cruise control to 99 it can get around just about anything I, it, I went through the Grampians which um, that'll be a drive that I have to actually record and I won't do it where you can see the Eon I'll do it where you can see the road so you can actually enjoy the scenery but um, it can just hit every corner perfectly whereas when you set it to say 100 and 102, 103, 104, whatever, where you actually doing the speed limit, it's a lot weaker, and it gets around, like I said, it gets around any corner that doesn't request that you slow down. I don't really know why they limit the torque at the higher speeds, it's it's interesting, that's kind of what you do with the driver's steering, it shouldn't be what it does when a computer's steering. But anyway, So, we are going to go Android Auto. And now this is... Uh, when you see CarPlay versus Android Auto, you'll realise just how pathetic CarPlay is. Audio stream unavailable. Android is active. I wasn't streaming audio anyway. So there's Android Auto. It's telling me, you know, it's all your typical little shortcuts and so on. And you can swipe them away as you don't care about them. And when you swipe everything away, you just, yeah, you get the time. And there's your main apps that you're going to care about. So, you know, Google Play Music, this is the home that we're at now. 
phone and uh, maps. And maps are here what, what we really care about because that's what it's about phone calls and maps. Navigate me to Rainbow. Hopefully, I got a reception out here. I didn't actually look before I hit that. Because out here, there's a good chance I've got no reception. No, reception is pretty bad. And to me, that looks like I've got no data, which isn't particularly surprising, to be honest. Which means we're running on offline maps at the moment. That's something that Google's done really well. The offline maps now, I've got it all downloaded for this area. Um, and I need it because of where I drive. Yeah, no reception. It's not going to work. Oh, look at reception. Let's give it a couple of seconds to connect. Navigate me to Rainbow. Is it enough? It is probably not. Oh, it is. I can't find the right address. You might want to try searching for it on Google Maps. That's what I'm doing, you dumb machine. Ah. Navigate me to Rainbow, Victoria. Navigating to Rainbow. That's better. Um, so now I'm driving. The moment that left lane disappeared, I'm driving. I'll let go. As you can see, it will still drive because it kind of sees the edge of the road. But you can see it's doing a really crap job. So basically, when I'm on roads like this, I kind of grab the steering wheel. Not because I always need to, but because I, you know, you shouldn't be trusting that. You really shouldn't. And we're navigating the rainbow. Navigation built into the car is nice. It's got nothing at all on Google Maps. Not in its accuracy, not in anything, and definitely not in its usability. Um, now, the other one is that these are the only two nav maps I'm using, but obviously, if I wanted to use Waze, I could. Um, Waze is good for the city, and it's completely useless for the country. So, when I'm in, Jesus, it's taking a long time to load. So, when I'm in Melbourne, um, I use Waze. When I'm out here, yeah. Yep, there's our one road. No town names, nothing, just, just, oh yep, yeah, it knows some stuff around. It's just rubbish. Navigate me to Rainbow, Victoria. Okay, handing off to Waze. Here are the search results for Rainbow, Victoria 3424. She's got a horrible voice. And there we go, so now we're using Waze. Now we might as well keep using Waze and get ourselves lost because lost is fun. Uh, and obviously, Play Music's nice. These are all the audio apps that I've got installed. I'm going to grab the steering wheel. Uh, Google Play Music. And if you don't know why I didn't grab, I grabbed the steering wheel then, I'm watching the road. I know when things are going wrong. This does not replace uh, grabbing the steering wheel doesn't replace you as a driver it's a driver aid and go straight on for five minutes to Dabula Rainbow Road then it'd be nice that it becomes more than a driver aid but at this stage it's not and obviously playing music and that's you know all voice controlled I could play this blah 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 And it's actually, yeah, like I said, it's pretty good. So this obviously isn't the best, I don't know why it was there, but anyway, this isn't really the best song for showing up the system. And even if I did, I'm actually recording using the little camera. It's gonna sound garbage regardless. So, <laughs> let me just unplug. I gotta check that message. They're going to drop in anyway and then give me a call once I get there. Right, yo. Jeez, I've got a lot of other messages. I can wait until I stop. 
Um, just for the record, I can let go of the steering wheel and it is going to drive, but on a road like this, I've got my hand here ready to save it as soon as something goes wrong. I'm not actually steering. I'm still not steering for, you know, I'd say, or I still haven't, I don't, you can see now it's drifting, but it's staying there. I really aren't steering. So the point is that it's, it's still there, but on a road like this, I keep my hand on that steering wheel in case things go wrong. I, oh, I didn't actually have to save it, but the point is that I don't like the car doing that. I don't want the car doing that, so I keep my hand on there and might I feel do a big turn to the left, I can't, I'll stop it. And that's what you should be doing. So. Uh, where are we? Dimbula Rainbow Road, that doesn't tell us much, does it? There's no, don't expect radio to be working. Oh yeah, we get his. Yeah, because we're in the middle of um, Barton Central. Anyway. Where are we? Uh, Australia gets very dead. The moment you turn off the main roads, you start heading out places like this, Australia gets dead really, really quick. There's surprisingly little off the main roads in Australia. I don't know what, um, you know, I'm guessing most countries are the same. New Zealand wasn't like this at all. New Zealand was actually quite nice, but anyway. Let's plug Android Auto back in, because Google, I don't know if I've been, I might have a cable for an iPhone in the car. Play Alan Walker. Sure. Asking to play Alan Walker. So, they, it, like, Android Auto works really well, and it looks nice. It's very functional. It's yeah, it's a nice system. We'll we'll look at you know whatever they call it, CarPlay on the way back, which works just as well in this car. It's yeah. All it really is just a remote screen to your phone, and then the phone does everything. Obviously, the quality of the microphone matters in regards to detecting your voice, but nowadays all the cars are good, so they all work well. Oh, I've actually let go of the top properly now, I'm not resting my hand. I've got a left lane. Well, left line, it's, it'll predict this fairly well. So I'm back to the point where I can pretty much trust it. Um, as for the dual split climate control, me and my wife really hammered this one day just to see how far we could push it. So that was on one side we went high and the other side we went low. And the poor car fought like crazy and it, does, it actually does a really good job. So I've got this blurring, icy cold, full on air conditioner here and over here it's burning hot. Like it does a really good job. It's not burning hot yet. It's getting warmer. It's getting warmer. Mine's already full. Ah, it's really not nice. Though. It's 11 degrees outside, and I got the air conditioner blaring. But yeah, they really did. Actually, um, I'm going to grab the steering wheel because there's no hope of it getting this corner. Yeah, they actually did really good with the split climate control. Most of them are good, uh, but they're not all equal. Some of them, if you do something like that, uh, one side will be icy cold, and the other side will be ambient. Let's say or one side will be burning hot and the other one's ambient. Like, they don't all do that well. This one does really, really well. Because it was an old Audi A1 that I... Uh, A3, sorry? Was it A1? I don't know, I had it as a um, rental. I had it for a whole month when I was working in Tassie. And its split climate control was really average. Uh, and they're supposed to be the best. So, to be honest, it was perfect because we only wanted about one or two degrees difference between me and my passenger. So it did what we wanted. We've got to check where we're going. Come on. Oh, that's right. We're using Waze. Let's go back. Hang on. I said I'd trust Waze, didn't I? In 200 meters, turn right onto Rainbow Road. Brake. Open pilot's off. Now I'm going to show one thing I've done in the community build, which does not exist in the standard build. And that's, uh, I'm accelerating, and I'm going to resume cruise control, and I'm going to keep my foot on the accelerator, and it keeps steering. Cancelling, 
Um, honestly, you gotta check for trains. Where have we gotta go? Up here somewhere. Um, yeah, they've got this really weird idea that when you touch the cruise control, you should be disabling cruise control. Like, touch accelerator, you disable cruise control. Um, I cannot understand their logic at all. I just can't understand their logic. It's one, it's extremely annoying because we're accelerating like this and we go resume and we expect, well, that's a really bad example. Resume and we want to keep holding the accelerator. And, or you're accelerating and then you just hit resume and it cancels straight away because your foot's still on the accelerator. Um, you're, you're sitting there and then somebody pulls in and you just want to touch the accelerator so that the stock cruise control doesn't, you know, jam on the brakes. No, that'll just cancel it. Like, it's, it was just so annoying, so annoying. You're going up a steep hill, like there's no hills on this trip. Um, you're going up a steep hill. That was me on the steering wheel for the record. I'll let go. But um, this lane's too narrow, it'll struggle. Struggle, struggle, save. Um, yeah, you're going up a steep hill. And yeah, it, you got to help it a bit because the cruise control, otherwise it disables if you get more than 10 k's in the speed limit and it'll only really downshift twice for you and then it'll just run out of puff. I'll grab the steering wheel again. Um, that's really not the way that uh, you drive. If it starts struggling, just put your foot down and it'll kick back that extra gear and you'll be fine. Now, the other one is that they want you to use the gear shifter for what gear you're in. I want to use this. So, same thing, I'm going down a hill now and the car starts racing, starts running away and it applies the brakes. Now, behind me, I've got, you know, two tonne of trailer behind me with electric brakes and the moment it just starts touching the brakes a little bit, the trailer brakes go boom, gone and all of a sudden you're cooking your trailer brakes as you're sitting there going, oh, I'm doing so good at keeping the speed and you end up with cooked brakes. Um, the other one is if I've got a different trailer behind me, so I've got two ton again, it's got hydraulic brakes, the brakes do nothing and the car ends up having to ride the brakes the whole way down, stopping not just the car, which is designed to do. I'm going to have to drive this whole bit of a stretch. Um, it's got to drag that trailer on the brakes as well. And that's just going to kill you because when you get to the bottom of the hill, you're going to have no brakes left. So all you need to do is hit this button and go down a gear, down another gear, down another gear until the revs are high enough that there's sufficient engine braking. So in fourth, so it's an eight speed, in fourth we're doing 3500 RPM. If you just drop it back those few gears, then engine braking sufficient and it'll just cruise down there without having to use the brakes at all. But their methodology is you're no longer in auto, cancel the cruise control and stop open pilot. No, no, that's not what you do. That is not what you do, end of story. So, um, I'll better slow down for this. Now, yeah, so what I'm doing is I'm looking from the cluster at the moment. I actually do want to grab it from the transmission and look at what the other messages are for the gears. But at this stage, I'm using the cluster to actually look at what uh, gear I'm in. We're clear. Um, I'm taking these corners rather fast for the record. I know this road. I took it fast enough that the phone went sliding and unplugged itself. <laughs> yeah. And so, like I said, it, if I slowed down to a reasonable speed, Open Pilot could have driven that. But uh, my phone is. There it is. Anyway, didn't need to do that, did I? No lanes, I'll grab it again. Let's turn this off, we didn't need that plane anyway. Where are we? We are! Where are we? Previous destinations, Rainbow. Set as destination. 25 k's to go. The route guidance will start now. Continue yep. on in Bula Rainbow Road for about 3 kilometres. I click start guidance and goes, give me a gate, oh, just... It, it's like, yeah, just dumb. You don't need to be told that you push start. It's like I don't need a little musical tune played every time I start and stop the car. Just, there's some things in there. These cars where, yeah, unusual. We'll leave it at that. They're very unusual. So, yeah, I don't like Commas' idea of accelerator or give, you know, transmission K 
cutting it out, I took them out. I monitor the cluster for when I'm in drive because it doesn't actually tell you that you're in drive, it just tells you that you're in a forwards gear, which is exactly what we want. And I yeah, just removed the inhibit of touching the, an accelerator, cancelling and touching the brake still does because safety. But touching the accelerator, that's not safety, that's just dumb. So I removed the dumb. I mean, I'm sure they got their reason. Maybe in America they get the accelerator and the brake confused, but yeah, I don't know. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt so that they don't get them confused. But I have seen plenty of videos of pile up, so they probably do get them confused. I don't know. Maybe an American can tell me why you need an accelerator to cancel a cruise control because that's not something I can figure out. Um, actually, I'll let go of this. This corner I should steer along. I was holding it not because I knew I was going to have a lack of torque, but because of the sun. The angle of the sun's getting really bad, and what you end up doing is it, it ends up grabbing glare lines. Um, if the lanes were wider, it would actually be more reliable on corners, on corners this sharp. Um, it's not running meters, out of torque. It's turn just, left onto yeah. Imbula Rainbow Road. So I'm, it's steering, and it's doing a reasonable job. I'm ready to grab it at any time because it could fail, and you always should be. There's no point Continue that you shouldn't on be. Continue on Bula Rainbow Road for about 22 kilometres. It's so, so you know, sharp that the dumb building system actually thought that that was a corner, which is pretty cool. This is an 80k corner, so like I said, I'll slow this down to below 100 so that we get a bit more torque. Now it's a matter of whether it can see the lines or not. Oh, nah. Okay, I'll let go. Nah, I'm gonna grab it again. We're going a little bit fast. At least the phone didn't slide away this time. I've got so much rubbish here. Shit everywhere. Shit everywhere. You nearly did it, but not quite. Now I gotta steer again, because this really isn't the best road. Actually, this is a really, really good road to show you how much better than stock systems this is, but it's still, okay, 75. Let's do as it says. Let's slow down to 80 because it said 75 and no one ever does what they say. So I've reduced it to 80 and here we go. Look at that. It uh, can't see the bloody left lane. I'll let go again. Okay, so we're doing fine. It can't do it. Just, oh, watch the road, watch the road. Not the best roads. Um, I was doing a trip down the coast, and you really, that's where it really blew away because the lanes were nice and wide and there were sharp corners everywhere, and yeah, that's where you could really see how good this thing can drive. These roads are really showing edge cases. Um, and not edge cases for me, but well, they kind of are. Like, maybe I've done. 2,000 or 3,000 k's on these roads versus 10,000 on normal highways. So, but either way, they are still a significant part of driving for me on roads like this. Although I've ordered a Model 3, or I haven't ordered, I've got one. Actually, I can't even say I'm going to get it to be honest. I've reserved a Model 3, but depend. I really, really need another vehicle. I desperately need another vehicle. I will never buy another fossil. This is the last fossil I'm ever going to buy. As far as I'm concerned, fossils are dead. So, the next vehicle is going to be a pure EV, and I need it today. And there is no EV I can buy in Australia that's any good, uh, apart from ones that I can't afford, like the Model X and the Model S. I, I was actually looking the other day, and I, I can actually afford a bottom of the range Model X. But the thing is, it's going, to, it's going to be painful for me to repay. It's going to be something I'm going to always suffer repaying that vehicle off because it is more than I should be spending on a car. I can't justify it. And uh, even then, I've still got to wait till December to get it. So realistically, I'm looking at the Kia Niro or the Model 3. And it may not be which one's the best, or maybe which one's the first. So if I can go buy a Nero in Monday and I jump on Tesla's website in no, sorry, in January, I can go buy a Nero in January and I jump on Tesla's website and Tesla says your delivery will be sometime in 2019. I'm, I'm probably buying that Nero and cancelling my reservation. But if it comes January and I can buy that Nero and my estimated delivery date for my Model 3 is February or March, I'll probably get the Model 3. 
but if it's more than you know two or three months between Nero and Model 3, I'm going to be getting whichever's first, and that's really all there is to it. So, Tesla, listen to me. Hurry up and get your Model 3 in Australia because I want one. If you don't, I'm buying a Kia again. <laughs> Another Kia. But, like, seriously, I need an EV, and as far as I'm concerned, they're the only two EVs any good. No, any good in a decent price range. Because I need 400 kilometres range. End of, end of story. I've looked at where all the charging points are. I've looked at where I travel. 400 kilometres is the bare minimum. I realistically need about 500 kilometres range to give me that, you know, 70 or 80 kilometre buffer. And I need that 70 or 80 kilometre buffer because the battery will degrade. Weather will be bad sometimes and you blare your air conditioner. Sometimes you just have to floor it because you can. I'm going to need that extra bit of buffer. So, yeah, there's not many options out there for me. It's the Nero or it's uh, the Model 3. They're the only ones that fit in the price range, fit in the range that I need. And, uh, yeah. So it'll be very interesting because it will be doing actually more roads like this than what this car does. This car, after that, this car will spend, you know, 98% of its time on highways and freeways and just around town. The Model 3 or Nero will be the one doing trips like this and it'll be doing 50% of the trips on roads like this. So it'll be very interesting to know what autopilot on the Model 3 does if that's what I end up with. If I get a Nero, I'm just putting another open pilot into it. I'm just dropping them and done. I'll probably do the same with the Model 3 if it doesn't do better than what um, you know this car does. So if I get the Model 3 and I take this down the road and I take the Model 3 down the road the Model 3 doesn't do as good, I'm chopping that loom. Well, I won't see if I can use plugs, but either way, the point is that um, open pilot will be getting in it. Now, uh, if I'd let go of the steering wheel, you don't know how hard it is holding on to the steering wheel all the time. You know, to think that some people have to do it all the time now is ridiculous. Just, yeah. Yeah. 12 kilometres from destination, and I have talked to you guys this whole way, just done nothing but ramble. So what am I going to title this YouTube video? Rambling drive down country roads? Yeah, that'll do. Ramble. It's just a ramble. It's not an update, really, as to how the car's going. It's just a ramble. So I suppose back onto this car. We're on a country road. We're doing the speed limit. Let's check out what our noise level's like on this road. It's pointed at some different angles. over there. Now actually worth noting is that I've got the, um, the sunroof open, uh, not the air part, just the uh, part which lets sun in. So you can see that if I'd shut up, you'd see that it's only doing about 68. So I'll shut up. For a tr I'll, I will try to shut up. Let's set it slow so it averages things out. So this bit of road's a lot noisier. We'll close the top. Hey! Uh, we're not closing the top because there's a camera there. Ah. Sheet. Idiot. Oh, well, turn that off. Ah. There's my camera looking. <laughs> I'll knock you off. Oh no, you're still there. I wonder how wobbly you are. Anyway, still there. Let's drive down the centre of the road. Come on, open pilot. Drive down the centre of the road. Drive down. You used to love doing this. You used to be really dangerous driving down the centre of the road. So it is better. I, I come down this road. It wouldn't have even been a month. It was probably 0.5.1. It wasn't that long ago. And if I... I could not drive in a lane, it would just drive down the dead centre of the road. And right now I can't even make it drive down the centre of the road. So I'm actually rather impressed that, you know, it's getting better. Um, hey, drive the steering wheel, don't drive me into, well, there's nothing there to drive me into it, but don't drive me into nothing. Uh, if you're going to drive, no, don't, 
drive me to a tree. If you're going to drive me off the road, drive me into something. At least look like you're trying to kill me. Not that you're just trying to take me under a detour of nothing. Anyway. I'm going to leave it here, guys. Um, because of where I'm going, I really can't show you. Um, obviously, you know, I'm going to Rainbow, but that's as far as I can really show you from here on. Uh, it's all, you know, permits, paperwork, blah, blah, blah. And, um, yeah, I kind of can't tell you or show you anything. But this is how I make my living. Not driving. Like, driving's a big part of it. It's what I do when I get there. And it's not prostitution, if that's what you're thinking. I bet you were. So, I suppose the other one worth mentioning, since we've got a little bit left, is the economy of this vehicle. Um, I think 6.8 is what it's rated to, 6 point something. Never. I, honestly, you will never ever achieve that. We've done 7.7 since whenever. Um, yep, 7.7. 7.1 for the last 100 kilometers. And that's about it. I think it's rated to 6.8 never ever will you get 6.8 um, unless you're going downhill the whole way uh, I did actually uh, for curiosity I did actually try to I'd been hypermiling this car now the hypermile speed of this vehicle is somewhere around 75 or 80 kilometers an hour it's somewhere there or at least it was on the day that I was doing it now obviously a lot of factors come into account when you're hypermiling and I was able to get this thing down to about 6.2 or 6.3. It's so impractical. Like in here I would have been, you know, accelerated a little bit harder uphill just so I could roll on the other side because it turns out the torque curve for this vehicle, as long as it doesn't need a downshift, means that you're playing in the torque correct. And it was just ridiculous driving. But, yeah, so the realistic part is I'd expect this vehicle to be 7.7. No, all I've been is highway the whole way this trip. So 7.1 is what we've hit, and if you look at the instantaneous at the moment where the eights or so, I'm going to grab the steering wheel because you can just about guarantee it's going to steer me into, well, nothing, because there's nothing to steer me into, but it'll steer me into that nothing. It'll get me in the fence. It'll, it'll probably get me in, I'll probably roll. Look at the, look at the lift, look, yeah, I'll roll. Like, this thing's a boat. It'll probably just roll and then roll back, but anyway... Yeah, so right now we're sitting at maybe two or three, four. I don't understand where the cheaper vehicles have got much better range. This reminds me of Toyota's disgusting little economy bar. But anyway, there's the Sorrento running open pilot, community build by Emitex, which is my company, KU7, that's me. Um, cut if you wanted to know how to pronounce it because clearly that's how it's spelled and uh, I think I may be about near my corner that I've got to turn off so ta-ta thanks for watching and guys please subscribe if you don't want to watch the long rambling videos don't worry I'll let you know that there are rambling video that you can skip if you just want to know you know where tech's at and what I'm doing uh, again just subscribe I'll be letting you know if it's just a main minor update if I'm just showing off a bit of tech if I'm uh, doing something a bit different like say you know hacking a key cutting machine whatever um, I'll say it in my description don't worry so if you want to skip something that doesn't interest you go ahead and skip it but yeah so this is rambling trip showing on a really bad roads how open pilot and the Kia goes um, and I'm gonna leave you go because I'm lost and I need to make a phone call to find out where to go thanks guys see ya